This is Neurology Recall, a collection of our most useful, practical, and educational podcasts on a wide variety of topics selected from our neurology podcast collection. Whether you are new to neurology and training or have been practicing for many years, Neurology Recall is designed to help you continue to learn the essentials of neurology easily, one podcast at a time. Hi, everyone. It's Jeff Ratliff, Deputy Editor of the podcast, welcoming you to the October 2023 Neurology Recall. Regular podcast listeners surely noticed that through the month of August, Justin Abutamarco lined up a fantastic series of interviews with the world's experts on autoimmune encephalitis. From underlying science to diagnostic approaches to longitudinal care, Justin and the experts covered it all. And for this October 2023 Neurology Recall, we have compiled this fantastic series of interviews into one place. The first interview you'll hear is Justin's conversation with Joseph Dalmau about relevant research and clinical trial updates in the world of autoimmune encephalitis from the August 7th episode of the podcast. Next, you'll hear his interview with Sarosha Rani and John Soltis on a practical approach to diagnostic antibody testing in your workup of suspected autoimmune encephalitis, which aired on August 10th. In interview number three, Justin spoke with Grace Gombele and Owen Flanagan about expanding the differential diagnosis in autoimmune encephalitis. That interview aired in the August 14th episode of the podcast. And finally, the fourth interview you'll hear is Justin's August 31st interview with Martin Titular about the importance of longitudinal care for those affected by autoimmune encephalitis. We hope you'll enjoy this recap of interviews from August and we'll be able to refine and improve your diagnostic and therapeutic care of patients with suspected or confirmed autoimmune encephalitis. Happy listening and we'll see you next month. This is Jose Merino, Editor-in-Chief of the Neurology Family of Journals. The Neurology Podcast provides practical information to neurologists and other clinicians to help them provide better care for their patients. Thanks for listening and have a great week. Hello and welcome. This is Justin Abutamarco from the Neurology Podcast. And today we're kicking off a four-part series on all things related to autoimmune encephalitis. We're going to sit down and talk with experts across the world to help distill the most salient points in the diagnosis and management of this disease. And we really want to focus on practical management strategies because these cases can be difficult to manage in the real world. And I think there's growing awareness among other specialties such as oncology, rheumatology, psychiatry that have placed neurologists at the forefront of these conversations. Our series will cover the approach to testing to the long-term treatment for these disorders while also peering into the future to see what's on the horizon. I can think of no better person to help start this conversation than Joseph Dalmau. Josep is the director of the Neuroimmunology Program at the University of Barcelona and a distinguished professor at the University of Pennsylvania. Josep and his research team helped usher in this new era with the discovery of NMDA receptor encephalitis in 2007. So I'm excited to welcome him back to the podcast. Hello and welcome. Thank you very much and thank you for inviting me to participate in this group of talks. And maybe we could start off our conversation with any updates around NMDA receptor encephalitis. I think that there are several things going on with this disease. Many people know now the acute phase of the disease, but the long term, and particularly the post-acute stage of the disease, is not so well known. There are studies now approaching this topic, and we are very interested in the post-acute stage of an MDA receptor encephalitis. Just for example, and everybody probably knows what to do in the acute uh, stage. The patient probably is going to be admitted to the hospital, sometimes to the ICU, is going to be receiving immune therapy, is going to be checked uh, for the presence of a tumor and is going to be supported in terms of any complications that patient may develop, but at some point will improve, it will substantially improve of many neurological symptoms and will be discharged from the hospital at home or many times to a rehab center to have cognitive rehabilitation, for example, cognitive training. But nobody knows exactly how to treat the patients when they leave the hospital. And we are very interested in this and recently published a very comprehensive study of these patients in the post-acute stage. 
in which uh, we also included a group of patients or healthy participants and a group of patients with schizophrenia. And all of them underwent multiple different tests, uh, neurological, psychiatric, neuropsychological, and a sleep uh, test. And, and, and the findings were uh, compare. And we learned very interesting things of these patients, like, for example, that the cognitive and psychiatric symptoms at the post-acute stage are not so different from the ones identified in the schizophrenia patients. But the difference was that the patients with an MDA receptor encephalitis showed progressive improvement during the year follow-up that were included in the study compared with the schizophrenia patients. But there are many aspects in this study that... I think, help us to understand better the disease and perhaps also to understand better how to design clinical trials. I wanted to jump back to that first point you were making, that become better at managing or identifying these patients in the acute setting, right? But we have a gap in our care for the chronic management after the patients leave the hospital, the rehabilitation center with NMDA encephalitis. Do you have other thoughts? How do you approach those cases? What kind of resources do you highlight for the patients to help with their recovery? We have a continuation of the study that I just mentioned. This study was published in Lancet Neurology last year. And now we are doing a similar study, but trying to help the patients at home. That study showed basically is that most of the patients, they are no longer having, at least in this disease, of course, they are no longer having seizures or abnormal movements, what we would say clear neurological symptoms. But they are left, of course, cognitive alterations are, is a neurological problem, but they are left basically with this, with cognitive alterations and psychiatric problems. So I think that the patients need a multidisciplinary approach and a very close follow-up and also rehabilitation in terms of cognitive training. And we are trying to do this at home remotely. And even we are doing this remotely in terms of sleep studies and EEG registry remotely. So this is what we are doing. The idea based on findings of the first study is that if we apply, uh, help these patients with intense cognitive rehab during the first six, seven months uh, after being discharged from the hospital, perhaps we are going to help them to improve or expedite the improvement. What the study doesn't address, and I think is going to need uh, other studies, is for how long these patients should be on immune therapy. Many of these patients are no longer on immune therapy when we do this to them. Definitely some unanswered questions, but things that we can do in the meantime, right? Even just getting with cognitive physical rehabilitation services, focusing on holistic care like sleep. It sounds like these things are really important in the patient's recovery. Yes, I think that uh, is important. And of course, we manage this in a personal way. There is a study that we have completed that is not published yet in that the impact of following the patients very closely in terms of trying to understand better the disease, comes with very important surprises. Is that we have done a similar study with patients with anti-LGA1 encephalitis. And in here, the surprises were even bigger in terms that a substantial number of patients that are thought uh, that they are cured or substantially improved, they are much less better of what we think. It happens that in this disease, when you do systematic, uh, very close follow-up with, uh, for example, video polysomnography or EEG, what we identified, for example, is that in 50% of the patients, they still have REM sleep behavior disorder and still have, in about 20%, still have focal onset seizures that patients did not described, the families did not describe, and the physicians were unaware of them. And this is uncovered by this continuous registry. And of course, this has a lot of implications in terms of other symptoms. For example, the patients that have focal onset seizures or still have facial brachial dystonic seizures several months after 
the treatment and that you can see them particularly well during sleep, this interferes with sleep and there is a sleep fragmentation. And of course, this also probably affects cognition. So there is a first step in all these diseases, uh, which we think that we know and perhaps we don't know so well. And the first step is to try to learn from them and to improve of uh, knowledge. We think that we have a good grasp on this, but the more monitoring and investigations we do, I think we're seeing some gaps, especially in that long-term management. And so a ways to go for us in this field. Maybe we could shift gears a little bit and talk about perineoplastic neurological disorders. We've had some important updates around that. There were diagnostic criteria published in N2 in May 2021. And we've seen some work around why certain patients develop these disorders, maybe related to some genetic alterations that trigger the immune breakdown. How has that changed your practice so far? Well, in terms of the genetic alterations identified in some tumors, the main work was done by the group of Honorat, and the main work was done on patients with uh, that have uh, anti-YO uh, paraneoplastic cerebellar degeneration and uh, studying mainly uh, ovarian cancers of these patients. There are previous studies done by, by here and by my colleague here in, in Barcelona, Cesc Graus, in patients with breast cancer, showing that in the case of ovarian cancer, showing that there is overexpression of the CDR2 and CDR2L in the tumors of the patients and mutations also of this protein which is the main antigen of the disease. And in turn, this was done in ovarian cancer, but not in breast cancer. It was not found in breast cancer, but in ovarian cancer. In breast cancer, it was found that the paraneoplastic breast cancers have overexpression of the HER2 uh, gene. But again, these are interesting findings, but have not changed practice, at least until now. In terms of the criteria for the paraneoplastic syndromes, yes, this was published not long ago in N2 on this update on the criteria. And the main reason is that the previous criteria for paraneoplastic syndromes were published in 2004, which is just before the era of the autoimmune encephalitis. And so I think these criteria are interesting because you learn from reading them and some general concepts. And for me, one, one part that is interesting, for example, is that some terminology has been changed in order to reflect that not all the diseases associated with antibodies against intracellular neuronal proteins are paraneoplastic. For example, the GAD65 or the AK5 syndromes associated with these antibodies, these are uh, many times not paraneoplastic. And the other way around, that what is called autoimmune encephalitis, uh, like separating them from the paraneoplastic syndromes, well, this separation is incorrect. This is not so clear. For example, there are autoimmune encephalitis, like for example, associated with AMPA receptor antibodies or with GABA B or, or even the NMDA receptor encephalitis, right? In that some patients have tumors, uh, benign in case of NMDA receptor encephalitis, usually a benign teratoma, sometimes malignant, but usually benign. But for the other ones, you find that about 50-60% of patients they can have uh, lung cancer or can have other types of cancer in cases of the GABA B or the AMPA receptor encephalitis. So in some way, these are paraneoplastic syndromes. It happens that these ones respond much better to treatment than the ones in that the antibodies are against intracellular proteins. I think highlighting that idea of terminology matters, right? It ensures that we have the right diagnosis, that they're getting the comprehensive care that they need, and then we're communicating it to other specialties. I think it's really important. You recently published an article in Lancet Neurology in June 2023 discussing antibody-negative autoimmune encephalitis, where you expanded on your work in the 2016 position paper, talking about the clinical approach to the diagnosis of autoimmune encephalitis. What prompted this latest publication? Well, there are two reasons that prompt us to write this review that is categorized as personal view, but actually includes also a very comprehensive review on papers published on seronegative autoimmune encephalitis. But the very first reason is to emphasize the importance of the diagnostic algorithm, not criteria, but algorithm, 
that was published in 2016 in Lancet Neurology. Although many people refer to this paper by the Grau's criteria, etc., the main point is not this. There are criteria that are embedded in an algorithm to help to make the clinical diagnosis of autoimmune encephalitis. And the paper sometimes is, I don't know if it's misunderstood or, or the people jumped to the criteria and to the few tables that the paper has, but it has to be read from the beginning to the end. The main goals of this initial paper of 2016, the main goals of the diagnostic algorithm were to facilitate the clinical recognition of autoimmune encephalitis in order to support initiation of immune therapy without waiting for the antibody results. So that's very important that you have to keep this goal in mind to understand the whole process or the whole entire algorithm. So the idea is clinically recognize these patients, for example, in a moment in that you are in a place or in a country in that the antibodies, uh, you don't get the results in two days, but it can take several weeks. So what to do? So this is the main idea. And it was particularly focused on acute autoimmune encephalitis, because these are the most difficult situations that one encounters. The chronic encephalitis or patients that come with opsoclonus, myoclonus, which is also a form of encephalitis, that's not the goal here, right? The goal was what I mentioned. And I think that by jumping sometimes too fast through the tables of this paper or through the few criteria embedded, people also miss some critical aspects of it. For example, the three minimal requirements to suspect that a disorder could be autoimmune encephalitis. This was called possible criteria of autoimmune encephalitis, but are not disease criteria per se. These are the minimal requirement. These are the checkpoint that if you pass the checkpoint, these requirements, then is when the work starts. Then is when you have to go through the algorithm and that will help definitely to make the diagnosis of many patients. There was recently a paper about misdiagnosis of autoimmune encephalitis, and it was very clear that if you follow this criteria, most of the misdiagnoses were gone. And then we also wanted to emphasize very much that there are disorders to exclude, that there is a very important point here, which is pay attention to the disorders to exclude in this initial checkpoint, right? And what we have done in the most recent paper is clarify these and particularly emphasize the disorders that should be excluded, which many of them are easy to exclude, but one should keep them in mind, right? And then the second reason of the most recent paper was to address the seronegative autoimmune encephalitis. There is a flurry of papers of seronegative autoimmune encephalitis, which in our opinion, and with all respect for all the authors, are inaccurate. For example, one cannot talk of seronegative autoimmune encephalitis if only serum is examined. That's a major flaw. Many times because the antibodies are only identified in CSF. There are nowadays probably more than 30 antibodies reported, definitely more when you count cell surface and intracellular. So one cannot talk of seronegative if only six antibodies that are in a commercial kit are studied. So, I mean, this is incorrect. And the other thing that we found in some papers is that the patients included, they don't even fulfill the criteria or the minimal criteria of autoimmune encephalitis. So we wanted in this recent paper, we wanted to focus things because if not, the number of papers published on seronegative autoimmune encephalitis will multiply and will cause important misconceptions and errors. And this is more and more seen uh, in terms of many times just because a patient has an inflammatory disorder that is not infectious and improves with steroids is not necessarily autoimmune encephalitis. So this is what we wanted to address in this paper. And I just wanted to highlight that Owen Flanagan, 
actually was on the podcast on December 22nd in 2022 discussing that paper of autoimmune encephalitis misdiagnosis in adults, discussing those key points to look for CNS inflammation and making this diagnosis. So I think those are helpful points and folks can listen back at that episode to learn more. Maybe we could move on because it's a really exciting time in this field. We have several ongoing international clinical trials within the field. What could you tell us about those trials and maybe also where should we be focusing our research efforts moving forward? I think that's very important, the clinical studies about mechanisms and potential treatments of these diseases. And there is some work, uh, we publish some work, there are other colleagues that they are working also in some treatments beyond immune therapy for the post-acute stage, for example, an MDR receptor encephalitis. I think that one that I know more, of course, is the one that we are working and we publish preclinical data on animal models on these, which are the allosteric modulators, the positive allosteric modulators of the NMDA receptors. These are very interesting group of approaches of treatment that probably can help the patients in the post-acute stage of the disease. Then I think that an important line of studies is biomarkers of autoimmunity, neuronal damage, and, and inflammation. And I think that we should aim to identify biomarkers on these three categories. Some biomarkers for some diseases like neurofilament or, for example, GFAP are important. They may work in some particular diseases, particularly the white matter. But I don't see clear that a biomarker, for example, neurofilament light chain, that can be very helpful for one disease like MS, will be so helpful in, in another disease. So, I mean, each disease probably will need to have research to identify biomarkers. But in thinking a little bit in a more futuristic way, I think there are probably genetic, uh, we can use the blood test even, not necessarily CSF, CSF also, but even with blood tests with very sensitive markers that point towards of changes, more than alteration, changes in genes that control autoimmunity, neuronal damage and inflammation. I want to put an example that is very simple and just was published basically uh, days ago in brain of uh, the studies that have been done by my, my colleague Thais Armange here examining the post-acute neurological complications of herpes simplex encephalitis and the post-herpes autoimmune encephalitis. No? And this is a study in some way identify actually prognostic factors or factors that suggest that the patient is going to develop autoimmune encephalitis. And one of them is basically based on what's called interferon signature. There are several markers that are identified there. Essentially, there are three independent risk factors for developing autoimmune encephalitis, post herpes simplex encephalitis. One is the presence of neuronal antibodies three weeks after herpes simplex encephalitis. The other is the absence of a specific haplotype, which is HLA ACE2. And the other is, I want to make the point here, is the transient or moderate increase of the interferon signature on day 22. So what is the interferon signature? Interferon signature is basically a panel of genes. In this case, we examine 6 or 28, a panel of genes that change due to the presence of interferon, due to the, the infection with the virus. So Depending of the interferon signature, you can make uh, some sort of predictions if the patient is going to develop autoimmune encephalitis or not. But the point that I'm trying to make is the interferon signature, these, for example, six genes or 28 genes, the two panels are equally effective. You can test them with very simple blood test. So what I envision is that Similar types of tests, like for example with nanostring, etc., can be applied in the future to assess many different types of genes involved in inflammation, autoimmunity, etc. So these are futuristic studies, some of them not so far from now. And then, of course, the clinical trials, which are essential. Untangling 
that interplay of genetics and neuroinflammatory diseases is really interesting. And I agree, it's really going to accelerate over these next couple of years and hopefully will really help patients. I think this is a nice example where we can maybe identify these high-risk patients in the future. Joseph, I just want to thank you for this past, present, future take on autoimmune encephalitis. It's a rapidly moving target, but this type of conversation helps us stay up to date. For our audience members, the series will continue with a conversation with Sarosh Irini and John Saltz with a focus on antibody testing. So please stay tuned. Well, thank you very much, Justin. Thank you. Hello and welcome. This is Justin Abadamarco with the Neurology Podcast. And today we're on the second of a four part series on autoimmune encephalitis. Our last episode was hosted by Joseph Dalmau, where we reviewed updates on NMDA receptor encephalitis, along with some things on the horizon for the field of autoimmune neurology. Today, we are joined by Saro Shirani, professor of autoimmune neurology at Oxford University, and soon to join the Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville, Florida. Sarosh last joined us on the podcast on June 23rd, 2022, where we reviewed LGI-1 antibody encephalitis, where we discussed some retrospective data on corticosteroids versus IVIG. We are also joined by John Soltes, who's in a two-year fellowship at Oxford University and will also be joining the Mayo Clinic team in Jacksonville after training. They're going to walk us through a practical approach to testing for autoantibodies and autoimmune encephalitis. I think it can feel like a black box when we send those panels off. So our goal today is kind of to demystify that process. So Roche, John, welcome to the program. Thank you. Look forward to joining in. Thank you for having us. Sarosh talked to us about terms of this intracellular antigen testing, usually associated with our high-risk perineoplastic disorders, and how that contrasts from maybe the autoimmune encephalitis panels when we're talking a little bit more about cell surfaces, synaptic antigens. For me, really, it all boils down to a clinical pretest probability. One would always think that a good clinical assessment comes first, avoiding the possibility of false positives in laboratory testing, which we know is a problem. But Given that, often we think about intracellular antigens as being associated with the high risk of cancers and having a relatively lower risk of being treatment responsive, whereas the opposite is true for cell surface antigens, where cancer is relatively uncommon and a treatment response is almost universal. So when you're thinking about the two, usually there's a set of approaches which could encompass both or either. So if you think of both, people would often say, well, let's do immunohistochemistry. So let's take patient's serum, patient's CSF. Again, emphasizing these should be patients with a, with a good pretest probability of having an antibody and apply them to brain sections. That's often in many labs considered a screening diagnostic test, immunohistochemistry often referred to or immunofluorescence. And the idea is do IgGs from the patient's serum or CSF bind that tissue And if so, do they look like a pattern you recognize? Do they look like an intracellular pattern or do they look like a more cell surface pattern? Knowing that initial positivity and which pattern we look for will then send you down the route of specific testing for certain antigens, which we can often recognize on that immunohistochemical pattern itself. But you would go down and confirm that antigen. For So for intracellular antigens, often people would do Western blot, sometimes ELISAs. And then for cell surface antigens, often people would run cell-based assays. So it's that kind of algorithm, starting with immunohistochemistry and then going down two alternative paths which speak to very different clinical presentations and very different clinical meanings. Yeah, so we have that tiered approach for these, but definitely some overlap. And then you mentioned that importance of sending off samples from the CSF and serum. Can you talk to us about why that's so important, John? For the many different antigens that are tested on these panels, some of them are found more frequently or more readily in one of those compartments compared to the other. So for example, the LGI, if you're going after LGI antigen, you'll probably find it more often in the serum than the CSF, whereas the reverse is true for the NMDA receptor. That said, there's often significant overlap uh, between the two, but getting to the point that Sarash made earlier that you can run into false negatives and really thinking about pretest probability, sending both can really help you sort out, is this a meaningful result that you get when you do get a positive autoantibody? And is there ever a time when you're just starting the evaluation in serum versus sending both at the same time? I think there are occasions where that's necessary. Sometimes less severe clinical presentations where a spinal fluid examination may not be 
justifiable. For example, patients who present with seizures alone sometimes and perhaps sometimes in frequent seizures. Also in people who are behaviourally challenged. And then, of course, that includes a group of these patients with autoimmune encephalitis, particularly the patients with um, NMDA receptor antibody encephalitis, who can be some of the most difficult to manage behavior with on a ward. And then a small cohort of patients who are, for example, anticoagulated, where a spinal fluid examination may be relatively contraindicated. And then, as John said, Serum can be a valuable screen in those patients, but the problem is really that for each autoantigen, there's often a slightly different relative likelihood of detection in CSF versus serum. And so overall, I think the message should be wherever possible, begin the evaluation with both samples. No, I think those practical points, right? When you're up against challenging clinical scenarios, right? How do you approach those cases? And understanding that CSF is usually going to be the most sensitive space in order to detect these. You've mentioned this, maybe some certain patient populations that we should think through. For example, that like new onset refractory status epilepticus. How do you guys approach testing in that population? I think that's a particularly interesting population where Studies have suggested that the rates of autoantibodies can be high in some populations. I don't think clinical experience speaks to that necessarily. Nevertheless, there are groups of patients who have GABA B receptor antibodies, perhaps in particular, some with LGI1 antibodies who will present with status epilepticus. And in those patients, certainly a broad screen is often warranted, really often regardless of the detailed clinical presentation of that patient, because I think for that condition in particular, there's a notoriously poor prognosis and being able to assign a specific set of treatments to that patient and continue down an escalation of immunotherapy pathway can often be very helpful and an autoantibody can really help you do that. Whereas otherwise, I think with that patient population, it can be hard to know when to stop immunotherapy or when to go on and continue the treatment paradigm. So for me, that's a population where I think I would have a very low threshold of screening for them. And of course, their pretest probability is pretty good in terms of having an autoimmune cause, but it's perhaps not as good as was first mooted. Are there other populations or subgroups that we think have a unique kind of testing approach? There are some other interesting clinical presentations that can be associated with autoimmune encephalitis but are not necessarily all-inclusive. I mean, there are certainly other common causes for those symptoms, particularly like a first episode of psychosis. In general, if you have evidence that there might be something more to the syndrome, for example, if you have evidence of inflammation either from the spinal tap or an MRI, or if you have something in the history and keep going back to the importance of a good history that might, for example, be suggestive of, of a seizure or some type of preceding neurologic symptom, your pretest probability for testing starts to increase and it's worth considering sending the panels in those situations. Another possibility that many people consider is acquiring a sample or taking some extra sample to save for later. So when history is clarified or you have more information, you can go back to that initial sample and send the test if you're otherwise on the brink. Sarasha, would you like to talk about another potential clinical condition with pediatric autoimmune neuropsychiatric disorder associated with streptococcal infection? Sure, yeah. So the condition John's referring to PANDAS, or sometimes more contemporarily known as PANS, is a condition with a long history of various autoantibodies being detected in that, in that patient population. And I think a lot of that work is work which needs to be extended and continued. And some of those patients certainly have forms of autoimmune encephalitis. And I would like to think of them as pediatric autoimmune encephalitis rather than giving them an alternative diagnostic category. And it will be a small subset of the PANDAS patients. And those patients in a childhood setting, we think of NMDA receptor antibodies commonly. We think of GABA-A receptor antibodies in some of those patients. There are some papers on dopamine receptor antibodies. And then there's a large group of patients who have a clinical phenotype of autoimmune encephalitis who are seronegative. And I think there's a lot of important work to be done to really plug that gap in the the field at the moment. Now, there's so much work to be done, but I think some of these points are really important. Keeping that idea of the clinical phenotype, the pretest probability, 
John, I love your point about saving samples, right? If we're going in there and getting spinal fluid, right, try to save that extra tube because it does feel like there's other things that come up as you go along in testing. While we wait for these labs to return, right, which can take a little while, are there other things that we can utilize that can be useful in some populations, Sarosh? For sure. It's a very good point because I think there's a slight belief that one should wait for the results before thinking about treatments. But this comes back to the point John and I have both made and that you've emphasized there, which is a clinical point, really. We should be going on the clinical syndromes. And more and more and more, I'm pleased to say we're able to recognize patients clinically and then treat them before the antibody results come back. Which tests can we rely on in that sort of situation? As ever with medicine, the, the simple answer is rely on none. The combination, the triad of an MRI, a CSF, and an EEG can be very helpful, particularly, I think, if an MRI shows changes which are classical of an encephalitis, which can certainly occur in patients who are phenotypically mild, so it can help sometimes. And by that, I mean particularly T2 hyperintensities of the medial temporal lobes. Um, although, of course, there are other patterns. And a CSF with more than five lymphocytes, again, can often be helpful in giving you enough ammunition to say, okay, I'm going to treat this patient empirically while awaiting antibody results to come back. And of course, that goes as part and parcel of trying to continuously assess the patient and continuously reevaluate the patient for differential diagnoses as well as for the diagnosis of autoimmune encephalitis because a lot of this can come from reasonable exclusion of other causes and then you're left in this slightly difficult category still of seronegative encephalitis so i think i think certainly we should be thinking clinically with that triad of other tests and then occasionally we've also found that in some patients in particular HLA testing can be useful because patients with certainly with LGI1, with IGLON5 antibodies and with CASPA2 antibodies can have very tight HLA associations, sometimes in up to 95% of that patient population. So if they don't have the HLA of interest, that can often give you a useful negative predictive tool. But not over relying on antibody result, right? And trying to keep that in clinical context is really important and helpful. John, how do folks approach patients or testing in resource-limited settings or in settings where you know, they have restrictions within their practice or hospital? In any setting, whether it's resource-limiting or not, it's important to remember that an autoantibody test in isolation is never diagnostic. And you always need to go back to that clinical picture and think about what syndrome it is you're, you're evaluating for and testing for. In some instances, if you are in a resource-limited practice, some clinical features might sway you one way or the other. So for example, facio-brachial dystonic seizures are almost pathognomonic for LGI-1 encephalitis. And perhaps ordering the antibody is, while it has a high pretest probability, is ultimately less helpful for you with your overall clinical management. But obviously, for, for some of the other antigen, that's not possible. Going back to thinking about your clinical evaluation picture, it's important to also um, think about Sarash's point that seronegative encephalitis is nevertheless a clinically meaningful and useful diagnosis to, to have on your differential or to specifically make uh, for the patient, and that can inform your clinical practice. More and more, there's more trials coming out on how best to manage some of these patients and looking at response to different immunotherapies or different evaluation paradigms, et cetera. So there's other things that you can fall back on in the absence of knowing the specific antibody. If you do treat them through their acute episode and want to refer them out later on down the road or have them follow up with a specialist, it can be really helpful um, to, again, think about pulling some extra serum or some extra cerebral spinal fluid aside for uh, later testing, um, perhaps in a research setting, or um, you know, via, via some other methodology um, to, to help inform a, a provider later on down the road. Sorosh, any other helpful points in that challenging population or world? I think the other thing I would like to emphasize is that within poorer countries, certainly we are looking to try and find ways to offer good value testing, which could be high throughput. So I think 
these kinds of approaches are underway. We should look forward to them. And I think there are certainly ways to do this, which may or may not benefit from panels. And it may be that in some cases, for example, more focused testing is required. So it's not implausible that a clinician who's seeing these patients, a general neurologist who is seeing these patients, will have a very good idea of exactly which autoantibody they're aiming to look for here. I think patients with NMDA receptor antibodies, LGI-1 antibodies, can be highly characteristic. Some of the MOG encephalitis patients, highly characteristic. So it may be sufficient just to test one sometimes. And that kind of approach could be rolled out in countries which are less resource rich. We definitely have some unmet needs and need to think about it and how we roll this out on a, on a more global scale. So I appreciate those points. Are there other antibodies in your practice that we find that we're overlooking when we're sending that panel? You mentioned one just during our conversation of GABA A encephalitis. I think one that we don't always think about, Sarosh. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, I think it's also important to say at this point that overlooking them is not unreasonable sometimes. This this area is fast-paced. Even for people that are fully immersed in the area, it can be hard to keep up. There are publications coming out all the time. There are rare antibodies. There are commoner antibodies. And I think my message overall in terms of which antibodies we overlook as a group of neurologists is to say, lean on your experts, because I think it is a very difficult area to keep up with. I think there are probably three main types of antibody, I would say, that can be overlooked. So I think we're learning about one still, very much so, which is the IGLON-5 antibody, this really exciting interface between autoimmunity and neurodegeneration, where patients can present with a usually very slow onset syndrome. And so something that we don't often consider in the autoimmune realm, but that's certainly something which when looked for is found more commonly than one might think. I think the other one is LGI-1 antibodies still. And I think that because they are often elderly and the seizures are often subtle. Myoclonic jerks are often mistaken for facial brachial dystonic seizures. Patients can just have small thermal sensations or shudders through their body, which can very easily be dismissed. And their insidious cognitive presentation, which it can often be, can be mistaken for a, a medial temporal lobe pathology, an Alzheimer's type pathology. So I think those are the two antibodies that can be overlooked sometimes. And then the other thing that is very important to mention is the overinterpretation of antibodies. And I mean that in the sense of particularly low titers of some antibodies, GAD antibodies, TPO antibodies, and with a number of colleagues from around the world, there's been a very nice recent study in JAMA Neurology looking at exactly this problem. And actually, overdiagnosis leads to overtreatment, leads to complications for patients. And again, leaning on your local expert just to get a little bit of guidance in which testing modality is the right one to think about in specific populations can often be very helpful. So those are probably my three areas, but I don't blame people for this at all. I think it's a very difficult area to keep up with, even as someone whose job is to keep up with that area. It is just a constant evolution and thought process. And I agree that friendly autoimmune neurologist is always right around the corner. Are there other practical points that practitioners should be aware of that could help them in clinical practice? A couple of other points to consider. One is really knowing what you're ordering when you order an antibody panel, because not all panels are created equally and not all panels are comprehensive. It's something that's really challenging, especially if you're in a busier practice to think about, but always just keep on the back of your mind that a limitation in interpretation might be due to, to how comprehensive the test is and consider if you need to order a different test. That's another area where leaning on your local expert can really help out. It's a quick conversation um, with them and it, it could be potentially very meaningful for you. Another thing to think about is, is that some of these antibodies are highly associated with an underlying malignancy. And if there's any red flags that you encounter clinically, um, for example, if it's progressing much more rapidly than you would expect, or if it's a, a cell surface antibody and you are hoping for a better response to an immunotherapy, while you're awaiting for the test results, it's worth looking into if you've done due justice and looking for an underlying malignancy 
for example, doing a pan CT, or if it's a more targeted malignancy, for example, like an ovarian teratoma in a young female with an MDA receptor encephalitis, considering that higher resolution image to look for the underlying tumor is something that can be really important and uh, can, can really change management just while you're awaiting for the antibody results. I like that point about the malignancy piece. And we talked about over relying on antibody results, but one area where you can really depend on the antibody is the help for the search and malignancy. You can let that guide that, depending again on some of the examples you just shared, that's really helpful. Sorosh, any other practical tips to share? Really difficult thing in clinical practice is just keep centered on the clinical features here, because I think there's a very good chance that most neurologists will remain other possibilities if they're not thinking too hard about the diagnostic panel. I know today is about the diagnostics and the laboratory testing, but just to re-emphasize that concept of keeping firmly grounded in the clinical features of the patients, their tempo of evolution, the alternative diagnoses, and always keeping as broad a mind as possible. I always go back to that. I really like that cognitive heuristics paper in Annals of Neurology published a few years ago, showing that neurologist thinking is the key element in diagnostics. I think well said. I think a perfect way to kind of wrap things up, John and Sorsha, I can't thank you guys enough for your time and trying to unlock this black box of antibody testing. For our audience, this series will continue with a conversation with Owen Flanagan and Grace Gombele on expanding the differential in autoimmune encephalitis. So please join us for our next episode. Thanks again, guys. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello and welcome. This is Justin Abadamarco with the Neurology Podcast. And today we're continuing our series on all things related to autoimmune encephalitis. Our last episode focused on antibody testing. But as we know, those results take time to return. And given their complexity, we need a systematic way to think through these cases, especially when we're considering initiation of immunotherapies. So today we have two for the price of one as we're joined by Owen Flanagan and Grace Gombele to help expand the differential when we're considering a diagnosis of autoimmune encephalitis. Owen is a professor of neurology at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, and has joined us many times in the podcast before with his last interview on December 22nd, 2022, Autoimmune Encephalitis Misdiagnosis in Adults, which really touches on some themes that we're going to discuss today. But if you haven't listened to that episode, please check it out. Grace is a pediatric neurologist at Children's Healthcare of Atlanta and an assistant professor at Emory University School of Medicine. And while this series has definitely been focused on adults, Grace is really going to help provide that pediatric lens to think about these cases. So thanks to both of you for joining. Glad to be here. Thanks for having us. Maybe we start with the clinical history, then talk about testing. What are some key elements that you think of when you're considering a diagnosis of autoimmune encephalitis? When I am seeing a child who is coming in for suspected autoimmune encephalitis, I do find that the clinical history is really important to making this diagnosis. And what I will do is I will actually start from the beginning. I will start with the birth history. Oftentimes, patients, families will focus on a sentinel event, be an infection, some other event that happened, and then they notice symptoms after that. But I think it's really important to highlight there could have been other things that were happening prior to the sentinel event. If you have the time and are able to, I also try to get a history from the teachers, uh, the teachers who knew the child in the year or two prior to the onset, just to get a sense of were there symptoms happening at school that the parents were unaware of. So that focus on their baseline neurocognitive function and to see really where things were changed or has this been more of a chronic issue? Right, exactly. When you think of autoimmune encephalitis, what are you trying to look for in terms of timeline when you compare it to be a developmental disorder? So with autoimmune encephalitis, it tends to be a more rapid onset, meaning that you'll start having symptoms or the child will start having symptoms within the past few months. Oh, and when you're thinking about this, what are some key elements outside of that temporal cadence of symptoms? Some other things we sometimes ask about is seizures, if they've been having epileptic seizures. A lot of times, autoimmune encephalitis patients will have seizures, sometimes looking out for facio-brachial dystonic type seizures and asking about that. Are they dropping things from their hand? Is their face twitching? Are they having any other movement disorders? Because sometimes they can associate with autoimmune encephalitis. And then, you know, I generally go through the full history, past medical history. Is there a long history of psychiatric disease, for example, that might 
might suggest that this is just an exacerbation of a chronic type condition. Is there a history of cancer that might suggest that this is a perineoplastic condition? For example, small cell lung cancer we know commonly associates with perineoplastic type um, encephalitis. I look through the medications looking to see is there medications that could explain the patient's cognitive dysfunction. Sometimes patients will come into us who are on multiple medications that could be interfering with cognition, opioid medications, topiramate's another one that can cause cognitive issues. So I generally go over some of that. And then, you know, in the family history, looking, is there a family history of autoimmunity or is there a personal history in the past of autoimmunity can be useful to look for too. So I look for some of these to both look for factors that might suggest autoimmune encephalitis and also factors that might argue against autoimmune encephalitis and a different reason for encephalopathy. What are some key elements within the MRI or CSF testing? I'm thinking about my differential diagnosis. So in a patient with, for example, a rapidly progressive dementia, I would be looking carefully at the diffusion-weighted images to see if there's any cortical ribboning or deep gray matter restricted diffusion that might suggest a prion disorder like CJD. I'm also looking for changes that might suggest an autoimmune encephalitis like inflammation within the mesial temporal lobes. Sometimes inflammation that extends outside of the mesial temporal lobes might suggest herpes simplex encephalitis. So I'm looking for some of those signal abnormalities that extend into the entire temporal lobe and up towards the insula. And then we'll look for other patterns that might suggest, for example, MOG antibody-associated disease, which can have multifocal MRI changes uh, within the white matter that can be recognizable in the setting of an acute disseminated encephalomyelitis or an ADEM-type presentation. And then we'll look at other sequences. We'll look at the post-gadolinium images to see is there gadolinium enhancement, as that's often a marker of inflammation. Also, the blood sequences looking at SWI and GRE as seeing blood products on the MRI is unusual for autoimmune encephalitis and might suggest a different etiology such as uh, vasculitis or some other vasculopathy. Uh, So there are some of the things that I, I do in my baseline screening looking at the MRI. And then in terms of the spinal fluid, I suppose we're always looking for an elevated white blood cell count. I always look also at the red blood cell count because sometimes if it's a traumatic tap, that can lead to an increase in white blood cells. Um, and then we look at uh, markers like oligoclonal bands. As some patients with autoimmune encephalitis will have elevated oligoclonal bands suggesting uh, inflammation in the spinal fluid. And then I think we can use our spinal fluid to look for our differential diagnosis. We talked about CJD. We can send off for the RT quick testing for prion proteins. We can also use the CSF to assess for cancer cells, malignant cells, as sometimes lymphomas can mimic autoimmune encephalitis. We can look for Alzheimer's disease biomarkers. And then, of course, we're going to be doing antibody testing. And those results, as we said, can take a while to come back. But I think some of the other tests can come back quickly. And of course, our infectious testing, herpes simplex virus type 1, for example, and other infectious testing, depending on the time of year, we may consider uh, within the spinal fluid also. And I think if the spinal fluid shows that it's bland or that there's no evidence of inflammation, you should at least stop and think, reassess, could this be a non-inflammatory or different etiology and not an autoimmune encephalitis? There are some exceptions. For example, IGLON-5, LG1 antibodies, and sometimes AMPA receptor antibodies, for example, can have a completely normal CSF and a normal MRI and still have autoimmune encephalitis. But usually there's clues clinically there. These patients usually present with a subacute or rapidly progressive condition. So the clinical clues can be there to help you in the setting of, of the MRI being normal or the CSF being normal. I think that focus on trying to identify those objective markers for neuroinflammation is super helpful. Grace, what are your thoughts? I agree with what Owen just said. This is pretty similar to what we would think about in children. In terms of additional imaging findings I might consider, you really want to see if it's symmetric pattern of something going on or not. So for example, if there's more basal ganglia involvement and it's symmetric, plus or minus diffusion restriction, you might think about a mitochondrial disorder happening. If there's extensive white matter involvement, but again, it's pretty symmetric, um, thinking about some of the leukodystrophies. And Grace, I wanted to build off of that one point you made about the genetic piece. How do you approach genetic testing in your practice? It can be hard to implement, especially in the acute setting. But we've had many conversations on the podcast where we've seen genetic disorders masquerading as neuroinflammatory disorders. 
So do you have any pearls or thoughts on how you deal with that on the inpatient, outpatient side? Yes. It also depends on your institution and what they're able to cover or they're willing to send out. When I think about genetic testing in these cases, first you have to think about what types of genetic testing is out there. And then you also have to consider what your institution will allow you send, both inpatient and outpatient, and what will be covered. So for example, the main genetic test that I will send will be chromosomal microarray, if you can get it, whole exome sequencing or mitochondrial DNA sequencing. And I'll talk about the differences between those. Oftentimes what I will start with is a chromosomal microarray, especially in a child with developmental problems. There's any evidence for regression. And the way that the chromosomal microarray works is that it looks for large um, changes in the DNA. So are large pieces that are extra or duplicates or missing or deletions. And so I think it's really important to know what the chromosomal microarray covers because the other testing will provide additional answers that won't be covered in the chromosomal microarray. And then if you have a patient with concerns for autism, for example, up to 40% of those patients will have an abnormal chromosomal microarray. So I find that a pretty good screening test in the beginning. If you're able to get this covered, then whole exome is where I try to go to next if I can. Whole exome sequencing is only actually covers 1% of your DNA because 1% of your DNA are exons. So it actually does sequencing of the exons and then looks for um, any point mutations. And this is something that you would not pick up on a chromosome microarray. And then depending on how the whole exome is done, one thing to note is that whole exome cannot pick up on large lesions and duplications, which is why you need chromosomal microarray to complement that assessment. It's helpful to have multiple family members. So that way, whenever they assess for different variations in the genes, they can see okay, this is a variation that we see that hasn't been reported with other individuals, but there are other individuals in the family with that same mutation. And so then they can mark that as less likely to be a pathogenic variant, for example. So oftentimes they'll need to do what's called a trio where you have the patient and then both biological parents. If you can get a sibling involved, biological sibling, sometimes they'll sequence siblings also. And then if there's other systemic problems going on that might point to you to a more focused genetic test and in particular specific genetic panel. For example, if you have a patient with a suspected immunodeficiency who also has neurological symptoms, there is primary immunodeficiency panels that can be sent. But I think generally both cost and for diagnostic purposes, I try to send whole exome if possible. I'll tell you, I didn't know about that microarray piece with autism. It's really interesting, again, a nuance within the pediatric world, but understanding which tests you're sending and what they are and are not able to screen for is really helpful. Owen, what are your thoughts? I guess it shifts a little bit, right, in our adult populations. How do you think through genetic testing when you're seeing patients? I think it's probably going to be a little less common in adults to see that, but I do think of a couple of scenarios, particularly mitochondrial disorders like MELAS can present with swollen temporal lobes or occipital lobes that can mimic the inflammation that we see with autoimmune encephalitis, and they also are episodic, so sometimes they will improve on their own. And if you give immunotherapy at the same time, it can mimic an autoimmune encephalitis. So I do consider about some of those mitochondrial disorders. And like Grace mentioned about the different signal abnormalities within the basal ganglia may help you with that. One other condition and clinical pearl that was taught to me was the acute necrotizing encephalopathy that can be associated with fevers and an infectious trigger. And some of those can be recurrent, and it's associated with the RAN, BP2, R-A-N, BP2 mutation. And we can sometimes see those patients come in to our adult clinics, and they often have a very severe deep gray matter signal abnormalities and um, associated with a febrile illness. So that's another one to think about, probably more common again in pediatrics, but one that we've come across in our adult clinics as well. Moving along, how do you guys think or utilize immunotherapy trials in your patients? I think the quote comes from House of God that no one should die in the hospital without a consideration of steroids. It still rings true even in today's world, but responsiveness to steroids and by extension, I think IVIG can create some confusion and it can be hard to decide on how to interpret those results. 
I think you're exactly right that all of us neurologists will use high-dose steroid trial, like one gram of IV methylprednisolone once daily for five days in patients where we're not sure of the diagnosis and maybe the tests are not back, but we have ruled out many things initially and we want to give a trial of treatment. You know, sometimes it's good to try and get some objective biomarkers before you do that because steroids can be somewhat activating and patients can actually feel a little bit better on steroids just from the systemic effects rather than a particular neurologic effect. So oftentimes, if possible, we'll try and measure a cognitive test before we do the trial and then after and see if we can objectively show improvement because we have to be a little bit careful because some disorders, for example, we talked about the mitochondrial disorders in hospital delirium, for example, its natural history is to get better. And if you give steroids at the same time, those patients may get better. There's also conditions like lymphomas that will respond quite well to steroids. So we always have to keep some of those things in the back of our mind as we're moving forward. And then I think we just have to use our judgment and ensure that we're following up and seeing those patients back after they complete the immunotherapy trial and really assessing, was it a true improvement? And then by that time, a lot of your testing may have come back. What I think we have to be also careful with, because a short course of steroids is generally fairly safe. But when you move on to second and third line immunotherapy like rituximab, cyclophosphamide, you really even need to take more care that you're sure about the diagnosis. And by that time, many of your antibody test results will be back and you should be able to assimilate all of the data and push towards is it truly autoimmune encephalitis or not before you make that decision to pull the trigger on some of those more serious medications that can have more serious complications. I love that point about the objective markers, right? It can be really hard to interpret retrospectively. And then making sure you collect all the necessary data as steroids or IVIG can kind of cloud that picture, whether it be lab data, biopsies, things like that. It's really important. Grace, how do you think about these trials in pediatrics? I think it's also challenging when you have a patient who's in the hospital who is acutely ill and you don't want to wait for these tests to come back. So I can sometimes understand why people are anxious or really excited to trial. But I agree that having objective measures is very helpful. Trying to get your lab testing, like you mentioned, Justin, especially getting your CSF studies before giving IVIG is helpful because IVIG can, as everyone knows, cause an aseptic meningitis and potentially affect those results. And then in addition to that, I also just like to try one thing at a time. Sometimes these patients come in, especially with new onset psychosis or new psychiatric symptoms, and we're doing multiple things at once, including starting psychiatric treatments. And so just to really make sure that we're not clouding the picture, I think doing one change at a time is most important because then if we're focused on results of those changes, then we have a better sense of what's actually making a difference. Do you notice that there are specific antibodies when they do return that cause some trouble or confusion? Oh, and maybe we could start with you and thoughts about antibodies that can be a little bit difficult to interpret. Yeah, I'll start out with thyroid peroxidase antibodies or TPO antibodies. You know, everyone's aware of the term Hashimoto's encephalopathy, but TPO antibodies are problematic because they're present in, you know, up to 20 to 30 percent of normal individuals, elderly individuals. So we know that a third of patients who come to our clinic may be positive for those antibodies, but a third of them don't have autoimmune encephalitis. So the antibodies themselves are not a good marker, and really the neural antibodies are going to be much better. The ones that Dr. Dalmau covered in the last podcast will be much more reliable, particularly the ones in CSF. So I think you have to be very careful with how much you read into TPO antibodies, including high titer. I've seen many high titer patients who do not have autoimmune encephalitis. So in general, I don't use that. I use more the things that we mentioned before, like the onset of symptoms, the MRI findings, the CSF, and the neural antibodies to make my decision. The other thing to mention is that some antibodies, when they're tested with older generation techniques like immunoblots or line blots, in isolation, when some of those neural antibodies are positive, they're quite prone to false positivity as well. So we can see a background rate in the general population. So we have to be careful with some of those 
older generation techniques. But I think many of the laboratories around the world have been trying to improve the techniques and now using more cell-based assay and immunohistochemistry or immunofluorescence patterns to try and really determine the antibodies that are truly predictive of autoimmune encephalitis. And I'll say that if antibodies are positive by both a cell-based assay and the tissue, that is even more specific for autoimmune encephalitis. So there's some of the challenges around some of the older generation tests, particularly the TPO antibodies, which I don't find very useful in my practice. Grace, anything unique in the pediatric world? I agree with what Owen said, that some people will send TPO antibodies. I also find them not very useful in those cases. And then you know, another commonly positive antibody that will come back and then people get excited about will be a very low positive, serum positive GAD65 antibody. But if the CSF is negative, if there's no other signs and symptoms that are consistent with GAD65, so for example, stiff person syndrome, then I think it's less likely to be a GAD65 mediated process. I know sometimes the Cunningham panel comes up, especially in our younger cohort. How do you think through some of those test results? There was a study with an independent lab who tried to evaluate the sensitivity and specificity of the Cunningham panel. And while all of the patients diagnosed with pandas in that cohort tested positive on the Cunningham panel, about 80% of the healthy controls also tested positive, resulting in a pretty low specificity. I think that the data is challenging with using the Cunningham panel. You know, sometimes, like uh, Grace mentioned, the titer can be helpful. For example, with GAD65, very, very high titers is what we usually see with neurologic disease, such as stiff person syndrome, but also MOG antibodies. The MOG antibody, MOG test is a little bit sticky. So sometimes we see low positive MOG antibodies in patients who have other conditions, while the high titers are very predictive of true MOGAD type presentation. So sometimes using those titer results can be helpful. And then and one other thing is that if the results don't really make good sense, for example, if you have a positive NMDA receptor antibody in serum, but it's negative in spinal fluid, that's unusual. And you might want to consider whether that might be a false positive or a not clinically relevant result. So looking out for some of those things, and you can consider contacting a local neuroimmunologist for if you have questions about some of the antibody results. And a lot of the laboratories that offer testing do offer a service where you can discuss with the physician about some of those results if you have questions. So I think utilizing some of those services can help address some of those challenges because it's very hard to keep up with all of the antibodies that are coming out and many of them have different specificities and some of them are a little bit more problematic than others. So I think reach out to your local laboratory if you do have questions on some of these results too. Definitely. Always a friendly autoimmune neurologist around to help interpret. And I like that description, the sticky because it can really feel challenging when you get some of these results and are discordant. But looking back and trying to take a big picture at these cases is really helpful. Maybe we could end on any other red flag symptoms. Again, I would come back to that insidious onset. So many of the adult patients, older adult patients, our differential is a neurodegenerative type disorder, dementia versus a autoimmune encephalitis type picture. And I think that subacute onset is going to be really critical. And then again, remembering to look through that medication list as there are many patients out there who have kind of a brain fog type symptoms that are is not really typical of what we see with autoimmune encephalitis, but they may have that related to chronic underlying conditions like in the setting of chronic migraine, in the setting of multiple medication use, they can have that sensation of brain fog. And that's not really typical of what we think of with autoimmune encephalitis. So that can be sometimes a red flag and there may be explanations for the cognitive complaints that the patient has within that history taking. Yeah, I agree that in the pediatric world, the same thing of that insidious onset where symptoms present since near birth, because we know most autoimmune conditions don't affect children right as when they're born. And then just really seeing what the clinical course has been over time. If a patient has had mainly behavioral or psychiatric symptoms, and it's been many years without the other features, such as 
seizures or a new onset movement disorder outside of ticks because ticks are really common. So about 25% of children will have ticks at any given time, especially in the preschool age. And so any new movement disorders outside of ticks or speech changes, that sort of thing, if it's purely or mainly behavioral and psychiatric, and that's been going on for many years, I think that's going to less likely be from autoimmune encephalitis. Well, Grace, Owen, we really appreciate both of you joining us today. We have our final installment of the series with Martin Titular, where he'll be discussing the long-term management of autoimmune encephalitis cases, so please stay tuned. But thanks again to both of you. Glad to be here. Thanks so much. Hello and welcome. This is Justin about Marco with the Neurology Podcast, and today we're finishing up our autoimmune encephalitis update series. Our last episode was hosted by Owen Flanagan and Grace Gombele, sharing with us some red flag symptoms to consider when working up a patient with autoimmune encephalitis and ways to expand the differential. Today, we're joined by Martin Titular, an associate professor of neurology at Erasmus University Medical Center in Rotterdam, Netherlands, where we're discussing the importance of longitudinal care. I think over the past few years, we've really seen the pendulum swing in terms of increased awareness of these immune media disorders within the hospital. And even on this series, we focus mainly on that setting, but these patients really need a long-term follow-up, and the outpatient setting can present some unique challenges. So I'm really excited to explore this topic with Martin today. Hello and welcome. It's nice to uh, be here. Martin, maybe we could start with some common syndromes like NMGA or LGI-1. How do you approach those patients as they leave the hospital? Basically, we use quite general perspectives, although every patient will need a personalized approach. But if you compare NMDA and LGA1, the two most common symptoms, they already show real big difference in how I approach them. Why don't we start with NMDA? Well, NMDA, of course, many of these patients have been extremely ill, spend a long time in hospital, and then they often go to rehab or sometimes to psychiatry, rehabilitation, and afterwards they get home. And then there's several challenges. One is to consider, do we need additional immunotherapy? And the other item is, do we need another symptomatic treatment? And the third one is, do we need adaptations for patient or family care? I think those are the three essentials. The immunotherapy, generally, it's quite easy. NMGA tends to be a monophasic disease. And therefore, once you've done your immunotherapy, we basically don't treat them beyond with immunotherapy. I would say general miscommunication often heard is that Patients are treated with rituximab for years because people assume it is something like NMOSD, but it's not. It's more like GBS. So it's a one-time disease. Most patients will only need treatment in the acute phase. I think this is a, a huge uh, difference and an important point to, uh, to, to raise. Um, of course, there are some patients who will develop a relapse. This is getting probably a little bit lower anyway because people are more treated by aggressive immunotherapy than they used to be 10 years ago. But also if you coach your patient and family well, they will recognize the relapse early on and then you can still treat them. Otherwise you're treating patients for several years without any proven additional efficacy compared to not treating them. We, of course, have shown that rituximab prevents new relapses, but in those patients, 94% of the patients received one course, well, one round of two to four courses of rituximab in the acute phase, but no repeated infusions. So I think this is very important and too many patients receive multiple bouts of rituximab, which I think is not necessary, or azathioprine or mycophenolate. Uh, The second thing is symptomatic treatment. And generally, patients tend to have a lot of symptomatic treatments because at the ICU or during their acute phase, they were severely psychotic or had refractory seizures, so they end up with multiple drugs. And most of them, you won't need them in the end. Of course, this might take a while. You shouldn't directly taper off everything. This should be done very carefully, monitored by us, by psychiatrists, by people caring for seizures. But in general, within a year, almost all patients can be tapered down from basically all medication. That's at least my experience. And I like that contrast with MS or NMOSD. 
I think those are the weird diseases, right? Requiring lifelong treatment, whereas these diseases can be monophasic. Treating one to two years can be sufficient in order to control this disease and give them a good chance for rehabilitation with the right services. Is that right? Yeah, and, and, and don't even think in most patients two years is necessary. They basically don't retreat them, at least for the NMDA. I've, I've seen some patients relapsing after six years or after 10 years, but if I would have started them on rituximab or isofiaprin, I would have probably stopped them after two to three years. So I'm not sure that this relapse after 10 years would have been prevented by treating them for some short time. However, if you compare this to LGI-1, I would say this is quite a in a way, a different disease. In those patients, we see relapses in about one third of the patients. And we used to treat them only by steroids in acute phase and IVIG or plasma exchange, and then taper down the steroids in like six months or something. In those patients, we saw that they still about 30% of them would relapse. And that's quite a high percentage. So in all my patients, I do discuss the use of azathioprine or mycophenolate to reduce this frequency. Of course, there have been no trials, but at least we see that our relapse risk has dropped to like 5 to 10%. Alternatively, rituximab in the acute phase or in the post-acute phase, just this one round of the rituximab probably has the same effects, at least for the initial years. And currently, we don't know whether you should repeat it and how frequently. This also probably depends on how your disease initially was. LJ1 is in a way also a, an easy disease because once you have seen the initial episode, the relapse is easy to predict because the relapse is exactly the same as the initial episode. So if it started with panic attacks and goosebumps, then the relapse will start with panic attacks and goosebumps. If it starts with FBDS, then your relapse will be facial brachial dystonic seizures as well. So you can really instruct your patient to recognize those, the family to recognize those. And if this is the case, then you can treat them within two days. However, patients would probably prefer not to have any relapses at all. Or sometimes in some countries, it, if you get one seizure, even if it's FBDS, you can't drive for five years. So that's, of course, then it's more important to avoid relapse at any cost. And in those patients, you probably providing them with chronic immunotherapy would be relevant. Of course, after three years, you still have the same question like, okay, should I continue or should I stop? And this is really a personal case-by-case -case comparison. For example, we tend to do serum antibody levels if we consider stopping treatment and also the faulted gated potassium channel at test. And we test do it before and then four months after the cessation of the azathioprine and then we see whether the antibodies come up or uh, if we should be worried about relapses. Of course, this is all still a work in progress, but it seems to be working quite well. Some patients actually refuse chronic immunotherapy in LJ1 or Casper 2. And in those patients, we tend to watch them closely. And especially the Casper 2, they tend to relapse maybe a little bit more frequently even, like a 50% or even more than 50% of cases. And those patients, when they have have had a relapse and we treat them early and aggressively afterwards, they probably are more open to receive chronic immunotherapy. So in that way, you always need to be in consideration with your patient and have a shared decision making. I think the exact approach isn't clear, but what is needed is that long-term comprehensive follow-up, right? Because these patients can relapse years after their index event. And so having that plan after they leave the hospital is really important. You've mentioned this a little bit on these relapses and some approaches, including antibody testing. Are there other things you do when you're considering or concerned about a relapse? And how do you differentiate that from other symptomatic pieces for this disease? Generally, the new symptoms in patients that have had an encephalitis are a relapse until proven otherwise. So for example, in LJ1, the seizure risk is low. So if they develop new seizures or the same seizures they had while they were seizure-free, then you should first consider it is a relapse until proven otherwise. So, of course, we check for infections because they can provide pseudo-relapses just like you have in MS. We check antibody level and we also tend to use antibody levels in remission so that we can compare. So, for example, the LJ1 
commercial tests tend to remain weakly positive. So then it's helpful to have this basic value when they are in remission. So you can compare to a state of remission and not comparing it to the acute phase of the initial episode. And the same is uh, holds true for CASPER-2. Generally, patients remain antibody positive, but we use the VGKC to have a titer. And that seems to work quite well, currently working on this item to show that it's actually working well as a predictor. For other antibodies like NMDA, it's a little bit more difficult. We know that serum antibodies are not very sensitive nor specific for relapses. And to have CSF in, while the patient is in remission, is often difficult. So for these patients, it might be difficult sometimes to see if it's relapse. Of course, if the patient is antibody negative, or very weakly positive, it probably is not a relapse. However, if it is clearly positive, but lower than it was in the acute phase, you're a little bit stuck in the middle because you don't know whether this was what was remaining from the initial episode or that this was an increase compared to the remission state. We checked whether NFL could be relevant, so NFL in serum, and NFL in serum can be of some value. However, it's a slow marker. So if you do it in the acute phase, it won't help you. But if you do it like one or two weeks later on, you might see that the NFL increases. And then, so in retrospect, it can help you to decide whether this is a, a relapse. So if we looked for patients where we had NFL left in the acute phase, in the remission state, and in their relapse, we could see that the NFL increased, but only a little bit later than the symptoms started. So that's uh, uh, only partially helpful. And of course, we do MRI if you show limbic abnormalities, uh, like normally can occur in encephalitis, but are not necessary. It will help you if you have EEG background pattern slowing while it was normal during the remission phase. This can help you, but this is all indirect. And in the end, it's also a clinical decision. But using those same tools you used at the index diagnosis to help differentiate a true relapse versus a pseudo relapse, I think that's really helpful. Yeah, the only problem is that the antibodies can remain positive even if you're recovered. So then the antibodies are a little bit less black and white than they are in the initial episode, especially for NMDA. This is a problem. So we've talked about some antibody mediated syndromes. I think, how about those antibody negative cases, right? That can make up a sizable portion of a clinic, and it can be really challenging. Do you have any pearls on those cases? I think that seronegative autoimmune encephalitis probably is a mixture of several diseases. And some might be antibody-mediated, some might be T-cell-mediated, some might be monophasic, some might be relapsing. So that's even more challenging disease group. I think that there are differences between like those one that follow the strict rules of probable seronegative autoimmune encephalitis according to the 2016 Krauss criteria, that's still quite a small group. And in those, initially I tried to taper off everything and see what happens because I don't know whether they will ever relapse. And all medication also has its side effects. So I tried to taper down and only if they relapse and I might actually do the analysis again to be sure that this is the real, the good diagnosis. And only when they have a relapsing disease, then I might consider to put them on more chronic immunotherapy. And depending on all additional circumstantial evidence, considering azathioprine, microphenolate, rituximab, sometimes cyclophosphamide. For the ones that do not meet the criteria for seronegative autoimmune encephalitis. So they have MRI abnormalities that are way beyond the temporal lobes. They have DWI restriction. They have contrast enhancement or changing things or atypical items. I would be a little bit more careful. And I tend to follow them very closely and still reconsider the diagnosis when they're relapsing is this really inflammatory? Am I not missing any opportunistic affection? Am I not missing a, a lymphoma? Is it not something I should reconsider? Because we know that patients that meet the initial criteria for possible autoimmune encephalitis, only a quarter of them actually had autoimmune encephalitis. And a lot of the patients had several types of mimics that just needed a lot more ancillary testing. So if they do not meet strict criteria, 
you should always be worried about a differential diagnosis. And therefore, I'm always a little bit reluctant to start them on chronic immunosuppression because that will really destroy all diagnostic opportunities. Or secondary, more aggressive immunotherapy. If it's a Whipple's disease and you know, put them on rituximab, that's not very good for their outcomes. So similar for some other low-grade infections, initial lymphomas might be responding well to steroids as well. But then in the end, you're missing the opportunity to treat them in the right way. So in those patients, always reconsidering, okay, should I not go back to square one doing the diagnostics again? Am I still on the right track? And only if I'm really convinced, or sometimes even after biopsies, then continue to go to more aggressive immunotherapies or chronic therapies. I like that idea of constantly rethinking about it. And I tell patients that too, right? That worry about those indolent infections or cancers or malignancies, right? Keep me up at night a little bit. And being open and honest with the patient that will continue to reassess, I think, is a reasonable way to approach these really challenging cases. Another question that comes up often is cancer screening in this population. So in the hospital, right, feels like everyone gets the CT, chest, abdomen, pelvis. How do you approach these cases, though, on the outpatient basis? What tests are you employing and how do you think through it? It really depends on the type of antibody. So patients with high-risk antibodies like HU or CV2 or AMPA receptor, those we tend to screen them every six months. Could be CT or it could be a PET scan. If it's, for example, a patient with NMDA, like a child of five years old with NMDA, we only do screening in the acute phase, but we don't do any repeated screening because the chance of a cancer is very, very low. Of course, if patients relapse, we do a re-screening. Also for LGI-1, which has a very low risk for tumors, we screen in the acute phase, but afterwards we don't do repeated screening unless patients relapse. For CASPER-2, it's a little bit the same mostly when they relapse or if they are refractory, we might uh, do repeated screening. So this depends on the combination of antibody, clinical phenotype, and also additional cancers that may have already been identified or other factors like if they have herpes simplex virus before NMDA that also has a very low risk of tumors. And generally, I use the PNS care score. So that's in the updated 2020 Kraus paper on PNS criteria to assess my risk. And the screening frequency depends on the, the likelihood of a tumor. For seronegative autoimmune encephalitis, generally, we screen in the acute phase. And we don't do standard repeated screening because we don't know whether this is any way perineoplastic, what are normal figures. Of course, if they're refractory or multiple times relapsing, those might be different cases and those might be red flags to repeat the screening. I think we talk about this all the time about not over-relying on an antibody result, but I think the cancer screening is one where we can really lean on some of the evidence where guides that approach where which cancer we're looking for, which modality we should use. So that's really helpful. And then I appreciate that comment about the you know, those seronegative cases because those can be hard. I know we also talk about age-appropriate cancer screening measures that they should be keeping up with and nudging them towards their primary care doc to help get those done as well. Yes, especially for the children, putting them on repeated CT scans uh, probably is not uh, very useful and potentially risky. So you yeah, completely agree. I know you mentioned this at the top, but what other services or consultants do you use for these patients? And you know, we talked about that importance of rehabilitation, but do you have any practical points on that end? Well, I think it's important once you start the recovery to incorporate rehab very quickly. And initially, they will be reluctant because your patient is too severely affected and often they have very low attention span. So they say, no, it's not possible at this time. But once they start improving, you often can reach a lot of improvement in a very short time. And then showing this change to the rehab facility will also show them that there actually is a lot of potential in these patients. So that might help to increase their enthusiasm because these patients are difficult for rehab because generally they have a combination of physical cognitive problems and behavioral problems. And especially the behavioral problems might be difficult in a regular rehab setting to handle while patients in the regular psychiatry ward only, the psychiatry rehab might not be challenged enough to improve 
improve physically well enough. And because they have lost a lot of their stamina and a lot of their physical potential due to the long admission. So in a way, I think it's very important to have both rehab and psychiatry involved in these patients, also making a plan how to taper down some of the medications, especially if you have a lot of anti-seizure medication and antipsychotics and sedatives, then these patients have some attention to all the tasks they should do. Additionally, I think neuropsychology is relevant to see how many domains are involved and what things should be taken care of during rehab. And of course, social services should be important as well. Many of these patients, especially in NMDA, are quite young. So they impact the whole family, the whole social system. And therefore, it's also important that you take in this whole process, take the family and the social environment because they have to get used to a patient that often has no recollection of their disease episode. So they have no clue why all these people around them are this worried. They have only like sketches of part of the disease. So they don't know why everybody is so concerned. And sometimes they have frontal disinhibition or they might have apathy. And all these items might be difficult to cope with, not only by the patient, but also by the family members and the caregivers. They have so many needs. I think you touched on a couple of them, right? This physical, emotional, I love that point about their social or financial needs that we have to think about and try to get them hooked up with the necessary services. So it's really helpful. And then that last point you made about caregivers, I think it can sometimes be overlooked, but they're crucial players in a patient's recovery. How do you help care for the caregiver? Well, it's difficult because we as physicians are not very used to dealing with the family otherwise than informing them, probably showing them that we recognize it, showing that they're not the only ones that go through this, that the sometimes you can help them meet other families that have suffered the same. And this can be patients with encephalitis, but can also be patients with other acquired head injuries because a lot of the fears, a lot of the remaining symptoms can occur also in a lot of other diseases. They might have different angles, they might have a little bit of different weighing of the different items, but still patients with a multi-trauma that has somewhat recovered but still have sequelae can quite resemble some of the symptoms that you would recognize in a patient after encephalitis. So they can learn from other patients with encephalitis, but also from other caregivers from patients with other brain traumas. And recognition is important, helping a little bit in expectations about how quickly things will go, but also the idea that patients will improve, but it will not only go up all the time, so that they might have hiccups while doing the recovery, that this is quite common, that there is a difference between a rehab setting and a setting at home where everybody expects so much more from you. The idea that they can't ruin their brain by doing too much, that they will just suffer for maybe for a few days to to recover from uh, their overachieving, maybe during it like a simple party or anything that we would consider nothing special might be still too much for those patients at sometimes, but that they can't hurt it as long as they know that they might hit the wall, but that in the end, their brain will not be impacted. That's important. And maybe even the other way around, what we saw in children that were smothered too much was that they actually had more problems in the end. So that it might even be important to try to trigger patients to past their borders sometimes to, to overcome their apathy and therefore try to recover as good as possible. And you cannot completely take away all challenges in life. You're definitely walking a fine line, right? Yes, no, no, definitely. But that importance of, of normalizing, I think, for both the patients and the caregivers. Well, Martin, I want to wrap things up. I can't thank you enough for taking us through this whole spectrum. This is a huge topic to cover from post kind of acute care for autoimmune encephalitis patients, but some really helpful, practical pearls here. And so thank you for your time. And we can't wait for you to join us back on the podcast. It was a pleasure. Thank you. This is Stacey Clardy, your podcast editor. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please take a few moments to subscribe, rate, and review the Neurology Podcast through Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. 
And remember, you can always head to neurology.org backslash podcast for our full list of past episodes, or you can also search by keyword in your podcast app for any neurology-specific topics you want to learn about.